and we'll do the other part after lunch. So to get us started on making biochar, um, we start with the, with the benefit that I mentioned in the beginning with those four uh, circles, biochar and energy. So this is a picture of someone who's making biochar on their wood stove, and they just take a tin can, put some sticks in it, close it up, put a lid on it, or put two, one can inside another, poke a few holes in it to let the gas out, otherwise it'll explode. <laughs> Toss it in your wood stove, and it's like a little oven in your wood stove. Your wood stove is gonna get to be about six, 700, 800 degrees in there in the burning wood and it will bake that biomass and make charcoal. So anybody can make charcoal in a wood stove with some tin cans. A question about that? Yeah. So the wood is not inside the tin can? It is inside it is. the tin can. That's called a retort. I'm not gonna talk a lot about retorts, actually, in this presentation. Um, but that's um, because I'm more actually interested in, in open fire methods and gasifiers, but that is, that is kind of one of the, that is the traditional way of making biochar is in a retort. So you have enclosed in a, in a vessel, heat is transferred through the walls of that vessel, and it's like a little oven. So um, I'm gonna talk about what are really probably more practical ways of making biochar. And um, here's one way that, uh, and this has been pretty successful. It's a biomass gasifier. In the Central Valley, there's there are now I think four of these in the Central Valley. Wow! It makes electricity. They're running off of uh, orchard waste, old busted up pallets and fruit crates. You know, so this is just waste that was either sent to a landfill and they paid a tipping fee for it, and they figured out well we could run it in this gasifier and get electricity, and actually, the the it makes charcoal as part of the process from an energy standpoint it's an inefficiency but from a soil standpoint it's a co-product so this thing makes energy and biochar it makes a ton per day wow. mm -hmm. yeah yeah so it's just the ash that's kind of left but it's it's char mm -hmm. so here's another way that um, biochar can be made as along with energy and the, this is a, a typical bioenergy boiler, like we see all, all throughout you know, our state. You'll find these things. There's one over at Rough and Ready Mill in Cape Junction. Small scale, you know, five megawatt plant. Um, you know, we, there's White City, of course, which is a much bigger plant. And we've all heard about these biomass plants that come up from time to time. They want to build new ones. But there's a lot of them already in existence. A lot of them are at sawmills. They're small, they're using sawmill waste, and they use the heat to dry lumber. Sometimes they get electricity out of it too. But it's just a really standard design of a boiler. And actually, they make a lot of ash. And in fact, there's a lot of this on the market now being sold as biochar. So here's how it works. So you've got wood chips going into this boiler, and it's, got, there's, it's called a chain grate that moves the material through. So, you know, you have to clean out your wood stove every now and then, right? It gets full of ash. It's the same thing, but it's automat automated. Um, but again, this is an inefficiency of this process. Not all the char ends up getting burned. So, um, and if you actually speed up that grate just a little bit, you can pull more char off of there. So what we're finding is these existing technologies can actually make a lot of biochar while producing energy. I just have to interrupt for a moment yes. and apologize. I just found out the Zumba dancing starts at nine. Oh, mm -hmm. holy cow. And I didn't know that, or we didn't know that. And so there's gonna be a lot of noise, oh, but yeah. they're from nine to 10. So if you want to change the schedule and go away for an hour and come back, that we're going to have a lot of jumping up and down that we oh weren't aware God. of until okay. now. <laughs> well, I learned this. You know what? Then we'll zip through this. Uh, this is hard, though, because I have a lot to give you before we go out and burn. Keep yeah. going until it gets done. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, so that was stoves. We don't need to talk about stoves. Um, this is a pyramid kiln that I've developed. It's an open fire method. It doesn't make energy. 
but it does make heat. And so I call it, you know, social energy because <laughs> and that's important too. You know, I mean, we evolved standing around a campfire. Um, so, and we'll experience this today. So the, uh, the other benefit of biochar is a way to deal with waste. There's all kinds of waste in our world. Biochar should always be made from waste wherever possible. Um, and so, you know, there's all kinds of things here. Um, and what we're going to talk about, though, is fuel load reduction. Hmm. So you can burn manure. Yeah. Yes, you can. And sewage sludge. There are now some wow. very big um, um, sewage treatment plants in California that are starting to pyrolyze sewage sludge, which is really nice because it can take care of pathogens. It can take care of right. um, pharmaceuticals. Which yeah, is a yeah. huge issue in sewage can. sludge. It can, yeah, it can break down those molecules. So, so here's, so this is our concern, though. We've got tons of this stuff, and um, we're spending a lot of money to dispose of it. You know, up to two thousand dollars an acre to cut, pile, and burn. And what do we get from that? Well, we get the waste treatment and the fuel load reduction, but we also have byproducts get some nasty things. We get smoke, and we get this, you see how this soil here is, is kind of burned down to the mineral soil, so we destroyed the, the soil um, duff, you know, the mm -hmm. layer there. You know, it's just like punching little holes in the soil wherever you do one of these things. So this is what we're gonna do today, and this is the alternative we've been developing. To, um, it's not too bad. You're just warming <laughs> up. <laughs> so um, we're gonna we're gonna experience this different method of burning, and I'm gonna go through the physics of why this works. But it's it's dramatically different, and it's just the difference between lighting it on the top versus lighting it on the bottom of the pile. And you see the difference in the amount of smoke you get when you don't light it on the top. So why, why does this work? So I'm going to dispel two myths here that we all have heard about fire and heat. The first one is heat does not rise. Okay? You might have learned in school that there are three methods of heat transfer. Conduction, radiation, and convection. Well, convection is not a method of heat transfer not in a fundamental way that radiation and conduction are. So if you, if, if you need more explanation of what radiation and conduction are, we can talk about it later. But um, convection really is just the movement of hot air. Hot air rises. It's lighter because it, heat makes air molecules expand. And the, so the cold air will sink and the hot air will rise. So it does move heat around, but it does it by physically moving it like you know, a hot water pipe moves it. But the actual heat transfer is through these, these physical methods of conduction and radiation. And, but because we think heat doesn't rise, that's, or heat rises, that's one of the reasons why we light on the bottom, because we think we'll light the stuff on top on fire better if we put, if we start flame underneath. So here's the second myth, and that is wood does not burn, okay? It doesn't. It really doesn't. What it does, what heat does to wood, though, is that it goes through these stages of dr first it dries the material, and as it gets hotter, then all those volatiles are released, the, the hydrogen and oxygen. And so the, the match is a perfect example of this um, because when you strike the match, you have your ignition source, and the wood starts to heat. And the gases rise, and when the gases, there's heat present, and there's gas, pre, the fuel present in the gas, and the, when the, those gases rise and get, can get oxygen, then you get a flame. And so, um, but a couple things happen to make char, because you know when you light a match and you just hold it, it goes out, you end up with a little stick of charcoal, especially a wooden kitchen match, because the, um, the flame is on top of the match. It's not underneath the match. It's on top of the match. And so the heat is transferring into the matchstick by radiation, not by convection. 
by radiation. And that chars it. And then, you know, at the, at the end of the match, the flame has moved on. And you have this end of the match sticking out there. And the char doesn't burn because the heat is gone now, because the flame has moved down the stick. So charcoal does burn, but it won't burn directly under the flame because there's no oxygen there. The flame's sucking up all the oxygen. And it won't burn on the end of the match because it's cooled off and there's not enough heat. So we're going to compete with Zumba here and show a video. Because I think this will help our general understanding if we know better actually what is a flame, what's going on with that flame. Um, excuse me. Pardon me. No, 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 not up there. I'm down here. Yep. Hello. I am a scientist, and I've come to improve your situation just a bit. See that fire over there? Have you ever really wondered what the flames are from that fire? I mean, look at all of those colors, and you feel that heat. It's hot, right? Well, gee, it must be torture being around all these flames and not knowing what they are. Here, take a look at this cupcake. You see the flame on top of this delicious looking cupcake? You do like cupcakes, don't you? Let's take a closer look, shall we? Fantastic! If we look at the flame on top of this cupcake, we first notice a few things, like all the colors. At the bottom, we have this bluish color. And the top is more yellow, orange, and reddish. Also, the flame is hot. Why is it so flaming hot? Well, to answer these questions, you need to know something very important. You see, everything is made of tiny things called atoms. And these things are the building blocks that make up everything. And they're really small. Smaller, smaller, even smaller. Hey, look, you can't even see them, they're so small. Exactly. Anything you can think of is made up of atoms. Yep, this air conditioner is made up of atoms. This delicious popsicle is made up of atoms. This ice water is made up of atoms. Everything is made up of billions and billions of atoms. Now this candle and flame, well they are made up of three kinds of atoms. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The carbon and the hydrogen are locked together to form a solid wax and wick. The oxygen is a gas all around us. Normally, the oxygen doesn't do much to the candle. It just bounces off of the surface, not doing any real damage. But when we add heat, the oxygen atoms go bananas, and they shake the wax like crazy, until finally, with enough force, they snap apart. They leave the candle as a gas, where they mix with the oxygen. Uh-oh, I smell trouble. Well, the fancy science word for all of this is pyrolysis. It's the first thing that needs to happen to get a flame. It's when the fuel turns to a gas. Now, let's see what happens when these hot gases combine. Ladies and gentlemen, in this corner, he was once a solid. Now he's a gas. He's the fuel from the wax. Now he's the hot one. But two new products. Ready? React! Anytime certain atoms get hit hard enough, they spit out light. And because there are lots of atoms getting hit hard, and lots of atoms spitting out blue light, you get a blue flame. Here comes another science word. Ready? Chemiluminescence. I know, it's a big one. One more time. Chemiluminescence. It's when atoms shine light when they rearrange. It's why flames are blue. Now, the blue light is not hot. Wait! But the blue flame is really hot. So if the blue light is not the hot part, then what does make a flame so hot? Well, remember our fuel atoms and our oxygen atoms? They rearrange to make new stuff like water and carbon dioxide. And as they rearrange, they snap together. And with each, the new things shape like crazy. So when the rearranging is done, we have lots of new stuff, all shaking really fast. If we put something close to those raging atoms, well, those atoms begin to shake like crazy, too, like the atoms in our finger. And that's heat. Ouch. This is called oxidation. It's when the oxygen atoms combine with other atoms to make new stuff. It's why flames are so hot. 
All right, then. Why are most flames yellow, orange, and red? Well, remember our first reaction? We had one group of fuel atoms and two groups of oxygen. They made a flame that was very hot and only blue. But watch what happens if there's not enough oxygen and we take some away. Ladies and gentlemen, what happens? It's okay, because all of us leftover carbon friends come to join and they form large black particles we call soot. Okay, they're not so large. They're so small, we can't even see them. But, to a single atom, they are enormous. Enormous! I know what you're thinking. How do black particles make yellow flames? Well, let me show you. But first, I need something big and black, like this pitchfork, for example. Excuse me, sir, your evilness? Could you please place your pitchfork into those scorching flames? Thank you. Big black objects are like sponges that soak up heat. They have to get rid of this energy, so they spit it out by glowing. The hotter they get, the more brightly they glow. Now, the same thing happens with our soot particles. They drink in the heat from all of those hot atoms, and they glow brighter and brighter until they look like this. And because there are millions and millions of soot particles all glowing hot, we get this yellow flame. This is called incandescence. It's when the soot particles glow because they're hot. It's the reason why flames are yellow. Well, that's it. That's what flames are. I mean, the new cupcakes give you so much fun. Remember, first the fuel loses mass and turns to a gas. Before the next change is through, atoms shine blue. When the process is complete, it gives off heat. Extra carbon will glow red, orange, and yellow. Hey, those are just like the lyrics from that really awesome song about flames. You know, the one that goes, The fuel is mass, it turns to a gas before the next change is through. Some atoms shine blue, when the process is complete, it gives off heat. Extra carbon will glow, red, orange, yellow. advanced stages of kingdom here. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Right. Make it by five. Okay, so I got another little video for you here. And this shows a practical application of fire science that I think you'll appreciate. 